Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new around here, my name is Sharon I'm a trainee clinical psychologist and in today's video, I'm going to be doing a Q&A. These are all of the questions that you guys submitted over on Instagram. So let's just dive right in. We've got questions from aspiring psychologists, from assistant psychologists, um, incoming trainees, the whole lot. So let's have a little look. So the first question is, are you enjoying the declin? And <laughs> at the moment, yes. If you asked me this three months ago, maybe, no, if you asked me this, Four months ago, maybe, in my last placement, I would have said no. I had a very tricky time on my previous placement. Um, just the pace of working didn't really suit me. I was in a community learning disability team, and I thought I was going to qualify into learning disability because a lot of my pre-training experience was with people with learning disabilities, and my research is with people with learning disabilities. And there was just something about the service that made me very aware that kind of the pace of working just wasn't for me but i do know where i want to specialize in now so that's always a good thing but yes so it comes and it goes um i think i found a good way of balancing things while on the doctorate as well which has definitely helped someone's asked tips for new trainees who are anxious about long commutes uni is an hour's drive and i hate driving um so i as an assistant psychologist drove from London to Essex every single day. So I've always had a very long commute, so that's probably why I was so used to it at the beginning of the course. Um, at the beginning of the course, I was also commuting um, for around an hour and a half to uni and back every day, so three hours every day commuting. Um, what helped me was that I, because I'm also an anxious driver, I don't like driving. I will do it, but I do not like it. Um, I did car share with two of the other trainees, so that meant that we kind of rotated every day that we had to go into uni, which meant that I was only really driving once a week um, to uni, which was perfect. Um, I also found that using my time in the car in like an efficient way, I would either call a friend, I would listen to a podcast, or sometimes if I was having a really hard day, then I would just kind of like blare my music and sing along in the car and that seemed to really help in kind of decompressing after a long day. Um, but also because I was in the car with trainees, I'd, we'd be talking about our day, reflecting on different things, just having a chat really. Um, or one of the girls I used to drive with, she always used to have a nap because she had a child or she has a child. Um, so she'd just have a nap in the car um, while one of us were driving. So I think trying to figure out how best to use your time in that hour and a bit will really help. Someone's asked volunteering places that aren't too time consuming. Um, this is a really interesting question, I think, because I think good quality experience comes from a good amount of time being in a service or a team, whether it be volunteer or paid. But there is something in this question that is pointing towards the fact that as an aspiring psychologist, you have to do so many things all at once. You maybe are doing a master's and then people are telling you, you get clinical experience by volunteering. And so you're like, well, how can I do everything in such a short amount of time? So I think my advice on this is, is that if you can get um, a job, which is a volunteer job, which is zero hour contract, where you can do an extensive amount of time, maybe at the beginning, and then we drop down your hours or kind of move your hours down a little bit. So. I used to be an online mentor for a website called Brightside Mentoring, I believe. So this was more a education mentoring service, but it still gave me really good experience in kind of talking to people. Um, I know that you can also be part of helplines, which are mostly out of hours. So it might be that you're working in an evening. It's key that you kind of have a zero hour contract rather than something that you're locked into. However, I will say, if you are going to be volunteering for experience, make sure you're actually getting the experience by having a good amount of time, which I know is really difficult. Um, don't just have it as a tick box thing on your CV because when it comes down to it, the only person who's gonna lose out is you if you go into a job and you're not too sure about what you're doing. Um, I've got loads of questions about people applying to the Deacon and Sci for the first time and I've got loads of videos on my channel about the process um, but maybe I should make a video specifically for first timers. Next steps for a finance graduate looking into Deacon and Sci after conversion masters. This is so interesting to me. Um, my partner is in the finance world and it's really interesting because there are a lot of similarities whenever we talk about our um, our careers and stuff and like the thinking that goes behind like the finance world. Um, however, as a finance graduate, what you probably will be missing, because you're going to get all the academic side, right? But you'll probably be missing that um, 
clinical experience, that care experience, and so my advice um, for you would be to look into kind of what work you could do to get that experience, so things like support work, um, healthcare assistant, research assistant, all of that. Um, another thing which might be interesting, I don't know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, other people who may have converted from finance into psychology, is that, especially on the course that I'm training and we talk about um, a lot about kind of the expert by experience, so the client leading the way um, and also subjectivity and how, you know, I'm, I'm, my course is mostly social constructionism, which basically means that there's no one truth, that there's multiple realities that can be true at one time. And I think for many finance people, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, this might be a massive assumption, for many finance people, that's kind of the opposite of how they might think. So maybe you need to look into that kind of philosophical side as well. Again, that will depend on what course you're applying to though, because mine is very kind of social constructionist. There's not one real truth kind of vibe. Do you experience imposter syndrome? If so, how do you deal with it, manage it? Um, this is really interesting, because I get asked this question pretty much every Q&A that I do, um, from being an assistant to being on the course. Um, and actually, when I read this question, I was like, I don't think I get it anymore. Like, I think at times I do, where I'm like, what the heck, I am a 26 year old woman who has somehow managed to get herself on the doctorate at such a young age and is meant to be doing psychology with actual real life people. Um, so in that sense, sometimes I do, but then I find it very easy to kind of be like, well, yeah, like, but I'm doing it and I can do it. I think because I've been on the course now for, I'm going to my final year, my third and final year, I think I've been put into so many uncomfortable situations. You're just thrown into placement. You're kind of, I think the best thing to do with the doctor is to say yes and try it. And yes, that comes with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of challenge. But I think that's why I've now become quite confident in like my clinical skills. Um, and because I know that my supervisor will always be there. I think as an assistant, you do feel like you have to do or know a lot more. And as a trainee, I've been taught that I won't know everything and that my team and my supervisors hold so much more knowledge than I do at this point in time. And that's okay. I don't think I feel like an imposter anymore as a trainee, but I wonder if it will kind of creep back in when I qualify. When I did get imposter syndrome though, I think the best thing for me was to speak to my supervisor about it and also other people on my course, just to normalize the experience. But to also kind of have this running mantra in my head of like, I'm on the course for a reason, I kind of, I'm gonna do it. What's the worst that's gonna happen as well? I think a lot with being an imposter is like that you're not gonna do it well, but actually like what is the worst that will happen? Um, as long as you're following the right protocols and if you're unsure using supervision, you are going to be fine. There are so many kind of safeguards around trainees or assistants to manage risk that it will more than likely be okay. Um, someone's asked, how many clients do you see a day? Is the clinical work balanced with research? So I have kind of my research days on Mondays and Tuesdays and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are my days on placement. So when I'm on placement, that's when I will typically see clients. Now, this will change depending on where I am on my placement. For example, I'm coming towards the end of my current placement, which means I've only got kind of one slash two active clients on my caseload, and then the rest of the work is like groups and kind of more written stuff. But when it's at its peak, we are meant to have kind of, um, they say six, around six pieces of work at a time. So pieces of work might mean one client um, or it might be a group or something like that. But typically I would see maybe one client a day um, and then have other bits going on, like a group therapy session, um, meetings and stuff like that. Um, but sometimes I'll see where scheduling work, sometimes you'll be seeing two people, three people. It really depends on the service and the kind of work. So on my current placement, I will see maybe at the peak of it, I had maybe three clients on my caseload, so maybe see one of them a day. And then I'd have a therapy group, which I ran, a staff support group, and then another staff support group. So, and then a parent care group, sorry. So that was kind of what my work was looking like. So the next question is, what's been the hardest part of the declin size so far for you? Um, I think for me, it's like the balancing of like personal life with the doctorate. Um, I haven't really spoken about this on my channel or any of my pages, but I went through quite a bit of a mental health struggle in second year. Um, 
and that was kind of because I found it really difficult to balance failing an assignment, going through a breakup, my best friend's mum, who I've grown up with, um, was really, really unwell with cancer and that was really difficult. So all of this life stuff plus the course and me failing was really, really difficult. So for me it was like, if that was regular life and I didn't have the doctorate then maybe I would have been fine. But because there was so much going on on the course as well, that was the hardest part for me was that I found it really hard to kind of centre myself when going through all of these other difficulties. All of those life changes are difficult in itself. On top of a course, um, was very difficult for me. So I'd say that was the most challenging part of the doctorate so far. The assignments, the clinical work, you will get them done. And, and I've always said that, like, even if I'm cutting a deadline short, I've got a deadline in 10 days. I, and I know I'll get it done. You just will. Um, and so... Yeah, I think that's the hardest part, balancing personal life. Anything that can make you stand out when applying for an assistant psychology post. Make sure you are using the person specification in your application. Be concise, use examples and be reflective. If you want to know how to be reflective, look at some of the videos on my channel. Any ideas of what area you eventually want to work in? Yes, I finally know where I want to specialise and that is in CAMS. I don't really know what kind of cam setting. I just know that I want to work with children, young people. So I'm going to be, so currently I'm doing inpatient cams. And I absolutely love it. It's been really, really difficult, but I love it. And I just know that I want to work with kids. So it might be um, pediatric neuropsychology or pediatrics, just general health or CAMS, I don't know, but I definitely want to work with kids and I'm really excited about that. Any tips on taking notes in DCLIN teaching from an incoming trainee? Um, most, um, most lecturers, speakers, they will always send you their presentations, especially on my course, they'll send you, they'll send you their presentations ahead of time. I find it quite helpful to just annotate on that online on presentation or I have recently been using OneNote um, because it's kind of like a desktop app which you'll probably get free with your uni um, and it's kind of like a notepad it's really useful it's got loads of cool annotation things you can draw on it if you have a tablet you can type you can import presentations onto it and then annotate on that so it's really useful another thing with note taking is that you just want it to be safe and backed up and that's why i think a lot of people on my course don't write they type what is the secret of getting good grades on the doctorate or any level in british uni so I can't really answer this as a whole because on the doctorate it's all pass and fail. So all you have to do on the doctorate is be good enough, okay? Just get 50, just be good enough. With other levels of kind of university in the UK, I actually didn't do massively, I mean I did all right, I got two one, right? It's about using the feedback, it's about doing the reading. I think reading other people's work can be helpful and universities always have that kind of on their system. So looking at how other people structure it, how they word things, looking at academic articles, see how people word their research is all very helpful. How can I make the most of a psych job that hasn't met my expectations and I slightly regret? Firstly, I wonder, are you looking for other jobs and can you leave? Because most likely you can leave and if you're really not enjoying it, then do that. But before you kind of quit and move somewhere else, I think you should look at the job description and see whether the job description matches the actual work, right? And then if it doesn't, then you have the ability to go to your supervisor and say, look, like, I did not have this in mind. Can we review the job description and see how we can make my job more in line to what I signed up for? You're in a more tricky position where maybe it has outlined it like it is in the job description, but maybe you haven't really fully comprehended it at the time, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, in that case, and I think the best option is to move because, I mean, that's what they've asked for, that's what you've signed up for, and so there might not be that much use in asking them to change the role but I mean there's no harm in asking and say you know if you're just very open in kind of what you have in your mind for how your career is going to progress e.g the doctorate then maybe you can say oh I plan to go I plan to apply to the doctorate next year or in a year or two and I need these experiences can you facilitate that and just be very open any advice for a year 13 who is looking to go into clinical psych just seek out as many opportunities you can to get that face-to-face -face experience so if you can now get a part-time job either volunteering or kind of being a teaching assistant or things like that. I'm trying to think what you could do like part-time as a year 13. Um, but yeah, I think 
any kind of care work is useful, maybe even supporting a young child or um, with learning disability. I think at your age you can't work with people over a certain age if I'm correct. I think that was the case back in my day. But yeah, and just read, read loads of books, talk to people, network. I think having mentors around you will be so useful. I mean, you're on Instagram, so reach out to people on Instagram to talk to about what they do in psychology and get as much information. However, just enjoy the journey, don't rush through it. Um, obviously in year 13 you're going to be thinking maybe about university, so you'll be looking at applying to a BPS accredited psychology course. Um, I would recommend doing a placement year if you can, and then take each year as it comes. Don't rush and enjoy the moment. Um, what will my final placement be? Okay, again, a very exciting question. So for my final year placement, I'm going to, well, it's actually gonna be a split placement between a pediatric service. So basically it's at the general hospital working with young people who have health needs. So predominantly young people with diabetes, but I'm also going to be helping to create the neonatal psychology pathway. So working with little babies and their parents or carers. And then for one day a week, I'm going to be working in an adult community mental health service, predominantly doing um, trauma work. So I'm really excited for that. Um, it's my dream final year placement setup, which I did have to fight for, but I'm, I did it. Second year advice, um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. For me, second year was absolute hell. <laughs> there were so many assignments on my course and just so many things to juggle. So just get through, do what you have to do. So make sure to take time for yourself and just be good enough. That's one thing in second year that was really drilled into my head. Just be good enough and don't push yourself over the edge. Someone's asked, are you able to have holidays while on training? I start next week and I feel my life is over for the next years. This is not true. Um, I have managed to go on holiday. I mean, everyone's different, right? But when I was growing up, I would always go back home to see my family in the Philippines every year. So that would be like one holiday a year. And then as I started to go, like get part-time jobs and stuff, I would then go on like small trips with my friends. So that would be another trip. So I've been very blessed to be able to have like two holidays a year. And I've definitely been able to maintain that on the doctorate especially over the summer. So over the summer, you don't have teaching days on many courses. So Monday and Tuesday is off. So you can always book that as annual leave and then have like a long weekend. What I will say is that it is harder to do longer trips. So when I go to the Philippines, for example, when I'm on the course, I do it over Easter or December, like Christmas time, which is obviously like more expensive. However, those are where you get the bigger chunks of time off um, from your study days. Placement wise, you can take annual leave as you would a normal job. Um, but you have to make sure that you're meeting the minimum days on placement, which for my course is 55 days on placement per placement, if that makes sense. Um, but it's just mainly your study days that you need to look out for. But you can, you can do it, you can have holidays. Um, it's also like the money thing, depending on how much like you've got put aside as well. Um, cause I mean, it, it depends on the situation on, on the course I've, um, I guess even though my salary's increased, I've also had more expenditure um, because of kind of like living circumstances and cost of living and stuff like that. So that's all just to bear in mind. Um, someone's asked, is it possible to get on the course of chronic illnesses and disabilities? Yes, and they cannot discriminate. That's literally illegal. Um, and they have to have reasonable adjustments. Um, there are quite a few people on my course who have long-term conditions. I don't have anyone in my course who has any mobility difficulties, but I do know on other courses that people do. I know someone in another year has difficulties with hearing, so they do have to kind of um, make reasonable adjustments. So yes, apply. And if they, if they make it difficult for you, then you need to report that to like the BPS, um, because that's not okay. If you could do it all over again, AP, CAP or PWP for experience before the DCLIN side. For me personally, I would choose an assistant um, every single time just because I felt like I was, I had close contact with a clinical psychologist, I had close contact with training clinical psychologists and I'm not too sure if that's the same for CAPs and PWPs. Also with CAPs and PWPs you are stuck in these roles for X amount of years now and you can't apply to the doctorate until like two years post qualification I think for PWPs but w double check but that has changed you can't just qualify and then apply to the doctorate you have to be in that role because 
these training programs, the CAP and PWPs, you are being trained to stay in a role and so they want to retain you. And I think that's a bit limiting. So yeah, I'd always choose an assistant psychologist. Um, what advice would you give to an undergrad currently on placement year? Um, I would say make loads of connections um, and yeah, get people's emails, make sure you have a good relationship with your supervisor because they might be able to provide you with a reference in the future um, and seek as many observation opportunities of like clinical work as possible um, and just say yes to everything so that you can get the experience. Um, requirements for international student becoming a clinical psychologist in the UK. Um, I made a whole video on that previously, so go check that out on my channel. Um, that's the end of the Q&A, guys. There were some other questions which I am making um, separate videos about, so stay tuned for that. Please be sure to subscribe, like this video for more content like this. More Q&As on my sofa. Why not? It's been cosy and it's been great. Um, but until next time, guys, I will see you later. Bye. Today, but...